and welcome to episode 74 of the Unseen Podcast. I'm your host today, I'm Adam Smith, and I'm joined as usual by some of my Unseen friends. Paul Carr is here. Hi, Paul. Hello. And we're joined by Shiro Via. Uh, good evening, everyone. And we welcome back Ryan McDonald. Hi, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Ryan, I've asked you today to come along and talk about some of your work as a uh, PhD candidate in the uh, Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at Cambridge University. What are you studying? What have you been working on? So I'm working primarily on the theoretical aspects of... Ex in principle, what I do is we take some Hubble observations that have already been previously reduced by other groups. And the basic idea is, given a transmission spectrum of an exoplanet, which is what we see basically by measuring the size of the planet as a function of wavelength when it passes in front of its host star, what can we learn about the makeup of the atmosphere, the chemistry of the atmosphere, and potentially other properties like its temperature, clouds that could be in the atmosphere, etc. So it's about how do we learn and extract the properties of atmospheres from observations of both space-based and ground-based telescopes. Right, that is an exciting new field. So what kind of exoplanets have we begun to characterize the atmospheres of? So the characterization of exoplanet atmospheres is actually already quite well established. It was only actually two years after the first transiting hot Jupiter exoplanet, HG209458 b, was discovered in the year 2000, that we actually got the first evidence of sodium in its atmosphere. And by seeing that, actually confirming that it had an atmosphere. So almost for 15 years now, we've had observations of exoplanet atmospheres, but it has almost entirely been restricted to hot Jupiter atmospheres. And there are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, they are very close to their host star, so they have very short orbital periods, maybe around four days or so. And so it doesn't take very long to build up a quite strong signal from multiple transit observations of these worlds. And also because they are so hot, their atmospheres are much more puffy and inflated. And so more of the light from the star goes through the atmosphere, which leads to stronger absorption signals from different molecules. So it's mostly been hot Jupiters up to this point. There are a few transmission spectra lingering around for what we call warm Neptunes, which might have temperatures about Celsius or so. And we have one preliminary transmission spectrum that isn't just a boring flat line of a super Earth, but plenty more of these smaller mass objects will be coming in the near future. So can you explain what a transmission spectrum is? Hmm. So the basic idea is if we are fortunate to be staring at a star and planet system that is aligned with our line of sight so that the planet appears to pass in front of the star, then what we do is we stare at the light from the star. When the planet passes in front of its host star, the amount of light that we see from the star will drop because the planet is absorbing some of the light. From measuring the size of this dip, you can get an estimate of the radius of the planet. It's just given by the ratio of the area of the planet to the area of the star. So that is what you would see if you're just doing a zeroth order estimate. But if you have very, very, very precise observations, then what you can actually see is that the size of the planet measured by this method changes when you look in different colours. So to give a simple example, if you imagine that you have a rocky planet with a very large atmosphere, and you look in a colour where the atmosphere is completely opaque, all of the light is absorbed by a certain molecule. Then the planet's size will be the radius of the rocky part of the planet plus the extent of the atmosphere. So the planet will appear to be much larger. Look in a colour where the atmosphere is completely transparent, it'll appear to be smaller. So when we say a transmission spectrum, all that we mean is we're measuring the size of an exoplanet as a function of wavelength or colour. Can you actually see absorption lines in the uh, in the spectrum? 
We absolutely can. It's relatively low resolution absorption lines that we're seeing at the moment. So they're quite broad features. So in some of the highest resolution spectra that we have at the moment, if we're probing something like a water absorption band in the near infrared, we might have maybe 10 data points or so stretching across the water absorption band. So um, we absolutely can see some structure in a higher resolution spectrum. Now, how, can, how can you tell those from the absorption lines on the star itself? Oh, well, we, we're actually, so we're observing the star before the transit and then the star during the transit. And so basically everything that we're seeing is starlight. And so when we difference the two, the only features that we'll see that are different from just a flat line will be absorption features from the atmosphere. Okay. So the method itself just subtracts the two. Makes sense. So, so it's a, the the um, would you characterize transmission spectra as a, a superset of absorption absorption spectra, or it's, it's considered pretty much a different type of spectra analysis altogether? No, it would certainly be a subset of absorption analysis. I mean, all, all that we're ultimately seeing is just light from the star itself, which is absorbed passing through the atmosphere of the planet. There are other types of spectra that we can obtain for exoplanets. One example is thermal emission spectra, where instead of waiting for the planet to pass in front of the star, this time we wait until the planet is about to pass behind the star. Because just before it passes behind the star, we're seeing the light from the surface of the star plus infrared radiation from the planet. And the second the planet vanishes behind the star, we're just seeing the light from the star. So we can subtract the two to get the thermal emission from the planet. And that gives us complementary information to transmission spectra. In fact, they actually probe different regions of the planet. During transmission, we're just seeing light that is passing through the day-night boundary of the planet, what we call the terminator region. But before the planet passes behind the star, when we obtain thermal emission, we're actually seeing the entire day side of the planet. And so already by comparing results from these two different methods, we can start to, if you will, build up a very, very basic map of what the conditions are like on different regions of the planet. All right. Now, can, uh, can you tell how hot a planet is that way? So if you want to... If you want to really constrain in detail how hot a planet is, thermal emission is the way to go. Because in transmission, you're only probing the topmost layers of the atmosphere because there are very low, there are very long path lengths through the atmosphere. And so very rapidly as you go down, the atmosphere becomes quite opaque. So we're probing atmospheres at pressures of about three bar or about, or about 10 to minus three atmospheres in transmission. But in thermal emission day side measurements, we can go all the way down to about a bar or even slightly deeper on these gaseous worlds. So that can let us not just tell the temperature of the planet, but the temperature as a function of altitude, which we can only constrain very weakly from transmission measurements. And there are some really exciting results that we've had from this. For instance, on the Earth, if you look at how the temperature changes with altitude, it starts decreasing with altitude and then suddenly sharply increases at the ozone layer due to the absorption of UV photons that warms up the atmosphere. So the temperature structure can tell you that there is an absorbing molecule in the atmosphere. And it's been theorized that if we see this huge increase in temperature with altitude, something we call a thermal inversion in these hot Jupiter atmospheres, that could potentially indicate metallic oxide species principally titanium oxide and vanadium oxide. And there's a lot of work considering whether we might be able to detect these species on exoplanets. There's been right. some controversy, hasn't there, about what exactly we are seeing in these hot Jupiter atmospheres. Can you describe what the controversy is? <laughs> so there was a lot of controversy with very early results from looking at exoplanet atmospheres because we were using instruments that were not designed to do this because the field of exoplanets didn't exist when the instruments were being designed. So there was a lot of controversy with things like early Spitzer Space Telescope measurements of the thermal emission from these planets, and groups analyzing them and the data points moving about all over the place. But the issue is that if you have a model of an exoplanet atmosphere, 
it might contain something like 10 different free parameters that you can vary. And if you have two or three data points, then you can make anything fit the model. And so you won't really learn that much about the atmosphere. So a lot of the controversy came from a particular instrument on Hubble that was called NICMOS, which is no longer working. There was that was what was used principally to establish early claims of water in exoplanet atmospheres. So the first claim of water in a hot Jupiter that is now accepted came about in 2007. But it wasn't really until 2013 that we started obtaining highly robust detections of water that pretty much has no controversy. So you, we now use an instrument on Hubble called the Wide Field Camera 3, which was installed in the last space shuttle servicing mission in 2009. And that has sufficiently high precision that we can get detections on the order of 10 sigma of water in these hot Jupiter atmospheres. So water is no longer controversial. We've, we are very good at detecting water in exoplanet atmospheres now. We even have a detection of water in one warm Neptune. So it's not just hot Jupiters. Actually, two, hot, two warm Neptunes now. Um, there is a different technique we can use called high-resolution Doppler spectroscopy, which has been used to robustly detect carbon monoxide in the atmospheres of some exoplanets as well. Um, that's basically looking for the thermal emission from the planet by looking at high resolution, seeing how the lines are Doppler shifted as the planet orbits its star. But it, it's a very difficult technique to do this one. And it can only tell you if a particular molecule is present in the atmosphere, whilst transmission and emission spectroscopy, like I work on, can not just tell you we have detected water in an exoplanet atmosphere. The observations are actually good enough that we can constrain how much water there is in the atmosphere, which is what I've been working on recently. And on one particular hot Jupiter that I've been studying, actually the first transiting hot Jupiter, HD 209458b, we've obtained measurements of the water that constrains it to about a factor of two or so. So it's remarkable that these are planets that we can't even directly see. We're just indirectly inferring their presence. And yet we can measure how much water there is in their atmosphere using instruments that were not designed to do this. And that's really impressive. Yeah, very impressive. So what can we learn about the amount of water that's contained in exoplanet atmospheres? So some of the controversy has been in reports of the amount of water in exoplanet atmospheres. Because if you, for many people that are modeling exoplanet atmospheres, they make an assumption called chemical equilibrium, where if you're familiar, you basically take the Gibbs free energy, you minimize it. You basically say, if the atmosphere was just a system left on its own, you follow the laws of thermodynamics and work out how many molecules of each type should there be when everything comes to equilibrium, which is obviously very boring. The, and the Earth's atmosphere is certainly not in equilibrium. Otherwise, we wouldn't have oxygen. Um, so, But if you want to include a model where you have hundreds of different molecules and you don't want free parameters for all of them, then you would just assume chemical equilibrium. So the problem is that under that assumption, we would roughly expect the amount of water should be similar to the amount of water in the sun of the order of about 10 to the minus 3 as a fraction of the atmosphere, so 0.1%. But observations of hot Jupiters have been starting to suggest that actually they seem to be much more depleted in water than what we initially expected, potentially by as much as two orders of magnitude. And this can have really interesting implications for our planetary formation theories. And there's a lot of work going on trying to explain how planets like these hot Jupiters must be forming if they are so radically depleted in water. So we're really at a critical crossroads because we're now going not just from detections of chemistry in planets we can't see. We're now going to how did the planets that we can't see form via the atmospheric composition? Or well, where did they form? Yes, certainly. You could potentially constrain where in the protoplanetary disk they formed. Um, from things like not just how much water there is in the atmosphere, but carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. You can potentially tell beyond what's called the snow line they might have formed based on where certain species in the disk to form ice that can be scooped up by the planet as it migrates inwards. 
So there's all manner of things that we potentially learn. I have a question uh, uh, for Ryan. Um, Ryan, so these um, techniques that are utilized for in um, for uh, detecting the uh, atmospheric chemical composition on the, these uh, hot super giants, hot gas giants, are there, are those techniques directly transferable to be able to inference the uh, chemical composition of the atmosphere of other types of exoplanets, such as smaller ones like uh, rocky ones? Hmm. So absolutely. In particular, the, the technique of transmission spectroscopy, which I use for my own work, has already been used for smaller gaseous planets, these warm Neptunes, and has actually been used for successfully for one super-Earth, 55 Cancri E. There were a few other super-Earths that it was tried for, but they appear to just be dominated by clouds, and so it's one. So the short answer is absolutely yes, and the James Webb Space Telescope will enable us to obtain transmission spectra by these exact same methods of smaller rocky planets. The issue is just that rocky planets, which have atmospheres that aren't dominated by light elements like hydrogen and helium, have much more compact atmospheres. And so the signals are a lot smaller than they are for hot Jupiters. For hot Jupiters, the signal from the planet itself might be 1%, a 1% dip in the light from the star, whilst the signal from the atmosphere of that. But then if you go down to an Earth-like terrestrial planet, then it goes down to about one part in a million or so, and it becomes much more challenging. Could be as much as 10 parts per million. So yes, and JWST will be able to do it, particularly for planets around M dwarfs, like the, the Trappist planets. We will be able to use these techniques to constrain the atmospheric composition of those worlds. Hmm. Uh, now, you, you mentioned that Hubble was not designed to study exoplanets. Uh, now, JDMOST, I think, has been more designed to study exoplanets. Uh, if you could design the perfect instrument for studying exoplanet atmospheres, what would it look like? Oh, the, per the perfect instrument. Well, the perfect instrument would obviously be an interstellar probe that could actually get there and see what it is. But that's a little bit too ambitious. Okay, done. So, uh, consider done. <laughs> <laughs> so, firstly, JWST is a catch-all. It's basically, it's pitches to solve every outstanding problem in astrophysics. And so even exoplanets will only get maybe 10, 15% of the time. And so that means that even JWST will probably only be able to characterize in detail less than 10 exoplanets, less than 10 rocky planets, I should say. And so that really limits the kind of comparative planetology that you might want to do. And wouldn't it be a shame if we if we find, for instance, we look at 10 planets and we find that none of them have oxygen because we just chose the wrong planets, for instance. So we want a dedicated exoplanet atmospheres telescope. There are some proposals, for example, um, ESA has a proposal that's been going around for a while called Ariel that could do this, um, but no, none that are actually approved to fly at the moment. Um, so that would be me looking at transmission spectra. In the further away future, you could potentially try and directly image these planets. So and that has a big advantage because we don't have to have systems that are aligned just right, planet pass in front of the star. We literally just stare at a star, filter out the light, potentially using something called a star shade or a coronagraph, and then directly see the light reflected from the planet. And, uh, and that would let us see... Yeah. Sorry? Go ahead. Finish, finish, your, finish your thought there. Yeah. That would let us probe the atmospheres of planets like Proxima Centauri B, which unfortunately does not transit. Uh, I'm so, uh, uh, now, JWST has something they call a coronagraph. Is that not mm -hmm. quite the same, or is it? No, it is the same. JWST will be able to carry out some limited direct imaging as well. Um, if you want to do direct imaging more successfully, that'll probably wait until the W first mission launches, maybe in 2025 or so. But even W first will not be able to directly image true Earth analogs. That will be able to do planets like Jupiter and Saturn, for instance. At, at the moment, we can't even do those. We already have some direct imaging spectra of planets in very, very, very wide orbits, much wider than the orbit of Pluto, for instance. We're talking order 100 astronomical units. So we do have some direct imaging spectra already, but we'd like to be able to push that into 2AU or so to be able to see 
true planets that are like Jupiter and Saturn. But you you really need something like um, a 20 meter space based telescope with a giant coronagraph if you wanted to go into great detail probing the atmospheres of true Earth analogs, which is why I think we should cheat. It's much easier if we look at planets around small M dwarf stars. That means that it's a challenge to analyze our atmospheres that we can solve this generation within the next five to 10 years instead of waiting for the technology developments to look at Earth like planets around sun like stars, which is still 30 or 40 years away. I have a question uh, for Ryan. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I have learned something today that, that's particularly intriguing. Um, well, first of all, I learned that you were involved in some of the analysis of the data for the Venus Express mission. Correct me if I'm wrong. The, that was the, um, the European Space Agency mission to Venus that was launched in 2005. Yeah, and that's correct. The fact, the factoid, factoid that I've learned is that uh, one of the things that was done was um, they used um, the observation of Earth from Venus as a model to be able to detect life uh, on planets that, that have a similar um, level of visibility as such as what Earth, Earth has from Venus. Uh, do you know more about this? Can you elaborate? If you do? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's remarkable actually trying to see the Earth as a single pixel and see how much you can learn about the Earth if you, you pretend that you know nothing. Thing. As the Earth rotates and it change, the fraction you're seeing in the field of view changes from ocean to land, for instance, then that subtly changes the reflectivity of the planet. And so you can produce a very basic map of continents versus oceans on a planet, even with just a single pixel, which is really impressive. And then if you do that for many, many, many rotations, and occasionally you see small differences, that can potentially help you constrain the cloud distribution and variability in time. And that, that's a, one of the really important themes about potentially seeing biosignatures on exoplanets, temporal, temporal variability, how things change with time. So there are spectral features you can also see, even from just a single pixel of the Earth. There are, if you look at just a satellite map of the Earth, you see there's many green areas, for instance, dominated by vegetation. If you take the average spectrum of our planet, the reflected spectrum, you can actually see this in that almost all of the red light is absorbed because the plants are absorbing it for photosynthesis. Um, but then suddenly the amount of light reflected rises when you, you go into green light, which is what we're seeing when we look at the leaves of plants. Edge, this sudden increase in the reflectance once we go from red light into green light. And we, we can see features like this, even with just individual pixels. So you'd, you'd be surprised how much you can actually deduce about the Earth just with a single pixel or, or just a spectrum of the averaged properties of the planet. Well, that leads me to the question. I mean, obviously, we thought Jupiter is just not an issue, but if we can image Earth-like planets uh, and we're looking for biosignatures, what, what, what do you think would be the most persuasive biosignatures that we could see with telescopes that are foreseeable in the within a human lifetime or so so when people are talking about biosignatures you you need you need to be careful because often a lot of these biosignatures could have abiotic ways of producing them so one of the ones that's tossed around most often and is familiar from our own experience is oxygen of right. course oxygen 21 percent of our own atmosphere is predominantly produced at least in the case of earth by photosynthesis so you could potentially also look for ozone, which is a direct byproduct of having large amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere. If you wanted to detect those, there are strong oxygen features at visible wavelengths. There's one called the oxygen A-band at about 0.97 microns. That would be the strongest one to go for and try and detect. They do also have many near-infrared features as well. So you, but you need to have a very long wavelength baseline for whatever telescope you're using because some molecules have overlapping absorption features, like water and methane have overlapping absorption features. And so to disentangle the puzzle of which species is causing absorption you might see, you need to look ideally from the visible all the way out at infrared. So from about maybe 500 nanometers up to about 10 microns or so. So oxygen and ozone, 
are tossed around as two possibilities. Methane is another really good one. Ancient life on the Earth in before the Great Oxidation event um, in the Archaean were called or were the microorganisms that predominantly produced methane as a waste product. They were called methanogens. And that's the kind of life that potentially has been speculated might exist in the subsurface of Mars, producing spikes of methane there. So in the early Earth, methane could have been as much as of the atmospheric composition. But even with present concentrations of methane, we can still see methane in the spectrum of the Earth. So the basic idea is if we try and find pairs of gases that shouldn't exist under chemical equilibrium and should only be stable for very short timescales, that could potentially be one avenue to assess them as being biosignatures. So those are some common biosignatures, but there's a lot of work going on trying to come up with better biosignatures. So there, there are some speculative compounds made of sulfur that are very difficult to produce by abiotic means, but are produced as indirect byproducts of life. So things like dimethyl sulfide or dimethyl disulfide. Um, the issue is they are produced in quite low concentrations. And so although they have strong absorption features, they might not exist high enough in the atmosphere for us to see them. But overall, the best biosignature, I believe, is nitrous oxide, N2O. If you want to produce that abiotically, then lightning can produce a little bit of it. But from all that I've seen from various studies, abiotic production mechanisms hardly produce any nitrous oxide, whilst it's a, a direct byproduct of life. And that could potentially be as much as maybe 10 to the minus 5 as a component of the atmosphere. And there are also studies suggesting that it might not just exist on atmospheres similar to the Earth that are dominated by things like nitrogen, carbon dioxide, or water. It could even exist on atmospheres with hydrogen or helium envelopes. And on those planets, it's even more difficult to imagine how you might produce nitrous oxide abiotically. So that's one that I would say would be not quite a smoking gun because we always need to be incredibly sceptical if we detect one of these gases. It will take a long time for us to try and rule out in context any abiotic production mechanisms. But I would say that is our best bet, nitrous oxide. Okay. Now, this uh, giant planet that you have studied was a, uh, about 150 light years, right, I believe, from Earth in Pegasus. Um, is that correct? Oh, yes. What, uh, HD 209? Yeah, about yeah. 150 light years away, I so, believe. Uh, yeah, so my question is, um, what kind of constraints there are as far as being able to detect the uh, composition of these uh, exoplanet atmospheres as far as the, what, um, you know, what's currently uh, available in, ter in terms of technology? Uh, what kind of constraints there are as far as the distance? So, you know, is there a, a certain distance limit where uh, detectability of... Uh, atmospheric composition becomes much more difficult or even impossible right now? Yes. Yeah, so as far as I'm aware with regards to distance constraints, I mean, I, I've seen spectra of planets about 400 light years away or so. And in terms of detectability, I believe the rough limit of current technology is pushing about 1,000 light years or so away. Um, unfortunately, basically, almost all the Kepler planets are pretty much ruled out. They're just too far away in the Kepler field um, for the majority of those worlds. So it's the best targets will be nearby, nearby stars, which are relatively bright, and ideally, small stars. The, the quantity that we're trying to maximize to get really strong signals is the ratio of the radius of the planet to the radius of the star. So small stars, and if they're cooler, we have an additional advantage because the habitable zone, if that's what you're interested in, is closer to the star, meaning the planet orbits much more frequently. And so there at a star and observe multiple transits so we can build up a strong signal of the atmosphere because the noise on the error bars will go like one over the square root of the number of observations. So, and, and it's a pity because there was actually one super Earth where a dedicated Hubble Space Telescope campaign to see 60 orbits of this super Earth it was GJ, I think it was 1214B, 60 orbits of Hubble, and it was a completely flat line, which either tells you it's a ball of rock, or more likely, it's an atmosphere with a very high altitude cloud deck, 
because clouds basically, at least in transmission spectra, have the same kind of effect as a hard rocky surface. They just absorb pretty much all of the light. So clouds are a big problem in our field at the moment, and we're still learning about how to predict which planets might have clouds or might not have clouds to maximize our chances of getting good, strong signals. So uh, a Venus-like a Venus planet would be uh, not a good candidate then? So I've, I've seen some studies that people have been doing specifically on the TRAPPIST system to try and figure out would you be able to constrain the composition of a Venus-like planet? Um, and the answer seems to be that, yes, if we had a Venus around TRAPPIST, you should be able to detect principally things like the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that's just because although Venus has clouds, the cloud decks are relatively low. And in transmission, we're probing very, very low pressures that go above the cloud deck. And so, so long as the dominant species are still relatively prevalent to those high altitudes, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Can I ask you about the, the problem of flat spectra? Have hmm. we overcome this problem? Um, so there's a lot, the, the issue is if, if a spectrum is flat, then you can't really turn it. I mean, you can do orders of magnitude estimates to figure out how high the cloud deck is. But the way to solve it would be to look at a wider wavelength range. When I say the spectrum is flat, I mainly mean it's flat in the very small wavelength range that Hubble can see, which goes from about 1 to 1.7 microns. It's a, it's a tiny range. JWST will be able to look from 0 0.6 microns, 600 nanometers in the visible, all the way out to 28 microns. That range is so large that there are features we might expect to be visible microns or further on. So the short answer is, although it's flat where Hubble can see, it shouldn't be flat at other wavelengths. The solution to these cloudy worlds. Cool. Can I also ask you about the work that you've been doing on uh, HD 209? Yeah, sure. You, you detected nitrogen chemistry. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so th this is um, an interesting finding. So we're it's really pushing the limits on what we can actually do with the Hubble Space Telescope at the moment. So what I've been seeing in my own work, so I've, I started off as a fresh PhD student, one of the first tests of a new computer program that I've been building called Poseidon, which is all about extracting the composition of exoplanets, was to try and reproduce established results in the field from one of the best studied exoplanets. And HD 20948B was an ideal candidate because it has a huge amount of data, I say huge, like 150 data points, a high precision transmission spectrum, and there's no, everyone agrees that there's water on the planet to about 10 sigma confidence. So it's a perfect test case. I created my code, I ran it, analyzing this planet, water and ammonia on this planet. And naturally, when you first developed a code, you see something that disagrees with what everyone else in the field has been saying you go away and try and figure out why your code isn't working, which I spent about a year trying to do. Um, and I could not kill this ammonia signal. And late, later on, I actually figured out that there are overlapping absorption features between ammonia and hydrogen cyanide. And so I conducted a more careful analysis and concluded that it's not actually uniquely ammonia due to this absorption feature. It could be either ammonia or hydrogen cyanide. And the data bar, the error bars and the data are just too large at the moment to tell which one it is. And we would need more observations either at higher precision or with telescopes like JWST to tell which one it actually is. But the point is that the reason people hadn't seen this before is that the primary absorption feature due to these nitrogen bearing molecules is right next door to the water absorption feature at 1.4 microns that everyone had been studying so far. And so it looked like it was just one broad absorption piece due to water. But the code that I designed, instead of just me telling it a set of numbers, generating a model, oh, it goes through all the data points, I'm done. What my code does is it makes zero assumptions about the how much of each molecule there is in the atmosphere. 
and it generates hundreds of millions of potential compositions to construct a map of all of the potential compositions and temperatures and cloud properties of the atmosphere. The answer it came to is that both water and a nitrogen-bearing molecule, um, and sodium as well, is required to explain the transmission spectrum of this planet. But it, it's, right at, it's right at the fringe of what we can do. The, the detection I got was about 3.7 sigma for the nitrogen chemistry. So it's a very, very challenging measurement. I have a question uh, regarding your study again, Ryan. I, uh, another thing that I found particularly intriguing in the, in the, in the conclusion, and, I, and I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit more about this, is that uh, one of the things that you found is um, based on your Bayesian uh, data analysis is that uh, um, the best detection was um, that, you, that, you, that you found possible is when there's a, a condition of a partially cloudy versus uh, clear or mostly or completely cloudy, you found that the partially cloudy condition was more ideal. Can you elaborate or explain a little bit more on uh, how you came about to the, uh, I came to this conclusion, basically? Hmm. Yeah, so there have been a few studies that have come about just three years that have been trying to examine how these atmospheres might not just have homogeneous one-dimensional properties. But how, I mean, if you look at Jupiter, in particular, if you look at the beautiful images that have been coming in from Juno, Jupiter is not just a circular blob with one color across it. It's not, but when we model exoplanets, that's effectively what, what we're considering. And when I'm studying the boundary between the day and the night, one implicit assumption that has been made by almost all codes up to this point is that the properties around this boundary between the day and the night should be completely homogeneous around this annulus of the atmosphere. But what actually would happen on these atmospheres is because they are tidally locked, meaning one side is always facing the star and one side is facing away, the day side will be many, many hundreds of degrees warmer than the night side. And so this drives strong winds blowing between the day and the night side, what we call a super equatorial jet. And what this can mean is that the western side of the day-night boundary can be about 200 degrees warmer than the eastern side, for instance, or the other way around, potentially depending on which way the jet's going. Expect clouds to form on the colder side, just like you know when you get out of the shower and you see droplets forming on the cold surface. And so that could lead to the case where you have a roughly half of the planet that has no cloud, and another half of the planet which has a cloud deck and this produces a qualitatively different transmission spectrum than if you have either an atmosphere with no cloud or an atmosphere with a complete cloud coverage. Difficult to model, actually. It's basically just a superposition of a model with no atmosphere, and no cloud, I should say, and a model with a uniform cloud weighted by how much cloud there is along the terminator. And so I found, actually, that a model with about 57% terminated cloud coverage performs radically better to about four sigma confidence than a model with a uniform cloud or five sigma to a model with no cloud, which, which is interesting because it shows that already with these very low precision spectra, we're talking about being able to extract some very preliminary two-dimensional properties of these atmospheres. And one of the really, really key results that I found in my study is that if you model an atmosphere, it has a cloud that covers the entire planet, that basically wrecks your ability to place good constraints on the molecular abundances, how much of each different molecule and chemical there is in the atmosphere. You get very sharp constraints if you have no cloud deck, but if you consider a model that has a cloud-free part of the atmosphere and part of the atmosphere with a cloud, then the light going through the cloud-free part gives you constraints on the molecular abundances. And the part going through the cloudy part of the atmosphere tells you about how high the cloud deck is. So by considering a more complicated model, I've actually been able to extract more information about the planets. And normally it's the case that for every extra parameter and extra complexity you add, it limits your ability to make inferences. And that was a really surprising result of my study.
it's really promising research. The whole field is really exciting. Is it competitive? <laughs> yes. Um, the, the field of exoplanet atmospheres is very competitive, as you might expect, because ultimately, I mean, the reason a lot of people are in this field is because the question of life in the universe and trying to detect life. Um, so, yes, there are a lot of groups that are very competitive, and the issue as well is that it's very easy for the public to understand and grasp many of the concepts. It's much easier we found water on a planet orbiting another star than trying to explain what the Higgs boson is, for instance. And so it's a very publicly and press-driven field. The discovery is made, then immediately a press release goes out, and that causes a lot of attention. And I, my personal viewpoint is that we have to be more careful and nuanced in the future about getting a result and then rushing for press releases. Which is why, at this point, I haven't gone for a press release about the nitrogen chemistry, because I think we need to be more careful assessing this, because it's at the fringe of what we can do at the moment. And who knows, maybe there's something I didn't consider in my model that could produce the same features. So we need to be much more careful about that. I agree. Um, with, I mean, that's true in a lot of, lot of fields of science, where they... The uh, <laughs> the university PR department is happy to push out a press release. Yeah, uh, so th there is, and I can give one example. So um, one result that is quite controversial that you might have seen, um, I think it's just over a year ago, is um, there was a transmission spectrum published for um, the Super Earth 55 Cancri E, um, where immediately there was a press release going out saying, We've detected the first atmosphere around a super Earth, and they also mention that they see suggestions of hydrogen cyanide in the atmosphere. Um, and by looking at the spectrum, you can see that within one sigma, you can basically fit like a flat line and all the features for the hydrogen cyanide. And so most people don't actually buy that that analysis is actually correct. But that's the result that got a lot of press and publicity and attention, even though basically none of the community actually buy and believe the results. So this is what I mean by you have to be a little bit careful when PR departments get too involved in it. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a competitive field because the public eye is on it to get obviously tenure track careers and all of this. But then equally, there's a lot of universities creating new departments and hiring people. So I think it all balances out. Sure, it's competitive, but I love that. I thrive on, on the competition because when you look at a spectrum, and you are seeing something that no one in history has known before about a planet orbiting another star. That's such an incredible moment, an incredible feeling that that keeps you going. And you just, it's addictive working in this field. You, you actually can't stop working on it just because of how exciting it is to make scientific discoveries so easily. Cool. Well, thank you, Ryan. It's a fascinating topic, as well as being an exoplanet scientist, you are also a Mars One astronaut candidate. Can we talk about that? Yeah, That's absolutely. Cool. What is happening with Mars One? <laughs> <laughs> Very succinctly put. So um, the short answer is almost everything that Mars One has been focusing on in the past year to 18 months or so has been on the financial side. Because um, what they have, what they've done in December of last year is they, they listed as a publicly traded company on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. The reason being is that there were a number of people that were interested in investing in Mars One, and they stipulated that list on a stock exchange, and then we will give you the X investment for X price for a 15% share in the company. And so basically, Mars One has signed a binding 6 million euro investment deal with a company called World Stock and Bond Trade Limited, based in Hong Kong. And that six million will be used, about a million or so will be used for the next round of the astronaut selection process, flying to a centralized location for five days of group challenges. It will also be used to expand the team at Mars One in particular to hire people who've had actual Mars missions before. Like they have someone from Lockheed Martin, for instance, that's interested in joining their team. Um, it's basically a cash infusion to actually, oh, and of course, fund many more conceptual design studies with companies like Lockheed Martin and Paragon. But this investment has just taken a very long time to actually go through the process. It's pretty much all bureaucratic things. At the moment, actually, the since March 27th, trading in the shares of Mars One are actually 
suspended on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange because Mars One had a capital increase. So they had a valuation conducted by a Swiss auditor and checked by a German auditor to print more shares, basically, following a valuation of the company's projected revenue and value at about $300 million over the next few years. So they had it to prove that they could create more shares. But then when the shares were actually created, they needed to be admitted to the stock exchange before they could then be traded. And so why this process is going on, you can't have some shares trading when there's a lot of shares of the company that are just being held somewhere else because that manipulates the price. So the short answer is they're sorting out bureaucratic stuff they need to do with the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and the German financial authorities. And until that's sorted out, they won't receive the investment and they can't do anything until then. So paperwork is holding things up effectively. Uh, you, I'm sure that you, that you are very well aware of the you know, fairly uh, widespread, <laughs> if, I, if I can use that term, uh, amount of, uh, of skepticism surrounding the entire Mars One initiative, right? Um, so for many camps. So if, I, if I'm playing a devil's advocate, I guess uh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to go ahead and uh, give you the opportunity. And, and I do realize that you're not a spokesperson for Mars, Mars One. You know, you're just a, an astronaut candidate. But do, can you um, somehow... Um, discern and be able to to clarify some of the the main points of skepticism and be able to you know absolutely some, some, sure. some, I, mean, some I always encourage skepticism some reasonable information regarding the, the 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 what's the reality check about mars one right now in a few words sure okay uh, what do you want to know <laughs> well i mean just in general i mean uh, do, do you, one of the main you know people think people say that um that it's really not going to be feasible. Like, I mean, just to put it in simple terms, people think that it's not going to, it's not going to happen. That just to put it, yeah. put it out. So, so I, when I examine the feasibility, I look at two principal aspects, the, the technical feasibility of the mission architecture as they have laid out and then the financial feasibility. So I don't think there are too many obvious on the technical feasibility front. It's a quite simple mission architecture that they have it's much less complicated in terms of actually getting the first modules landing on Mars, for instance, because they're looking at landing things on the order of five tons versus 40 metric tons or so for a more traditional architecture. They're not talking about launching 100 people to Mars or so in one go, like SpaceX's interplanetary transport system. Hopefully, we'll be able to do it at one point. It's a very simple, bare-bones mission architecture. There are, of course, some, some challenges that do need to absolutely be addressed, things like the design of the spacesuit and how you cope with things like getting off these small, this small particulate matter that is coating the Martian regolith that could be very corrosive. How do you deal with perchlorates, for instance, because they contaminate the water supply? So there's a lot of interesting work that needs to be done on the life support system, for instance. And Mars One has actually already paid for a study with um, the Paragon Space Development Corporation on the basic design of an environmental control and life support system, which has already been published and it's publicly available and they've published a second one on the spacesuit design so mars one has already funded some studies looking at technical aspects they would like to also issue one with lockheed martin to study the feasibility of landing multi-ton payloads on mars so i don't see obvious problems with the technical side side if they don't have money it won't happen and that, that that's just how it is so I would say the financial feasibility is the thing that's really being questioned at the moment because they have ideas, they have a funding model. And I have, I've seen detailed documents they've put together outlining their funding model that seem that actually are quite, I mean, they haven't made them public yet, um, but they're, they're in much greater depth than what you see from just looking at the public information. So they have revenue models and a funding projection that I think is feasible once they actually have an initial injection to actually get the ball rolling. But this is taking much, much longer than they expected. They expected originally to have the selection process finished in 2015, now we're in 2017, and they're talking about finishing it next year. And it's purely the finances that are delaying things. What about um, any kind of, um, can you talk about any kind of uh, progress with um, establishing relationships uh, with the SpaceX in particular? Yes, yeah, so... 
Yeah, Mars One have met with representatives of SpaceX, and SpaceX has also sent representatives to Mars One. The basic viewpoint that SpaceX has is, we're happy to sell you hardware if you give us money. That that's what they said. They said we will we'll sell you a Dragon, we'll sell you a Falcon if you have the money. We don't think you have the money, but if you get it one day, we're happy to sell you it. Well, oh, that, they're they're going. Uh, Elon Musk has his own plan. Right, which in, starts with Red Dragon in just a few years, uh, which will not be a not have a crew on it, but it'll, it'll land on it'll land on Mars uh, to show the feasibility of doing that, and we'll roll out some payload on the maybe some drones or some other uh, similar things. Uh, but we're everybody agrees we're still a long way from figuring out uh, if anybody can afford to send people. Uh, right, that, that's really. Well, I, that, I, I just want to. I mean, even, very even NASA's here. constrained. NASA's budget is never going to be much more than twenty billion dollars a year, and most of that's already spoken for. So, hmm. uh, you know, we don't really know exactly how anyone's going to afford it at this point. Well, I have heard that Elon Musk is scheduled to give a, another talk in September this year at um, the International Astronautical Congress, where I think he's going to be focusing more on the financial side of their mission architecture. So hopefully we'll hear more about it then, because um, I know he had just one slide speculating with like three or four bullet points at the last presentation. Um, so I'll be, I'll be very interested, but SpaceX have already shown that they're bringing in revenue. Now they're sticking to their two-week launch cadence. So they already have a successful business model just from launching satellites. And maybe when they start launching their own satellite instant internet constellation that they have plans for, perhaps that could be an alternative revenue stream. So I'd be very interested to see how they propose to actually fund it. But the fact that they're proving the principle of reusable rocketry, that alone is a game changer, which I think could enable, with the kind of budgets that we already have, human missions to Mars. I, I agree. I think that there's a lot of long-term optimism. Uh, <laughs> the short term is messy. Uh, but, but it's not just... Elon Musk is also Bezos, who's uh, hmm. developing a very large rocket called New Glenn, which uh, yeah, I'd be very interested. I believe New Glenn should be flying around twenty twenty or so. So, I mean, it's it's a very exciting time, and I'm particularly hoping that this year will finally be the year we'll see the Falcon Heavy launch, maybe October time or so. But um, because they, they've SpaceX has already static fired one of the side boosters in the central stage of the Falcon. So they've actually built the thing. The Falcon Heavy is ready, pretty much. Um, it's just, obviously, they've got to fix the launch pad and do... Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of uh, like preparatory work to do, yes. Uh, but I think it'll actually fly this year. I, I, I am obviously fundamentally an optimist, but um, I'm actually hopeful now that I've seen the hardware. Yeah, I, me too. I think I think it will fly this year. Um, successfully, pro I, mean, I would I would bet... I would bet for... I bet a success for it. Uh, I wouldn't give you a lot of a lot of odds, but <laughs> but uh, I don't know about dollars to donuts, but maybe donuts to donuts. Uh, yeah, and and once we and I think that the basic feeling that we have now is that the launch cost problem is slowly get slowly but surely getting solved. And, Absolutely. And then the next problem is uh, how do you survive on on Mars and uh, that's and we we recently I don't know if you listened but we recently talked to uh, a couple of young scientists about their ideas about that uh, and uh, for example food security on Mars how do we how does uh, how do we grow crops uh, there's some big challenges there that people are working on yeah. um, and p apparently uh, it's not quite as easy as Mark Watney had it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Mars One's actually done some work on the food front as well. They they've partnered with some science at Wageningen University in the Netherlands to look at yeah. the feasibility of growing crops in Martian soil simulants, the same kind of ones that NASA uses for simulating the properties of the regolith. And one of their conclusions was that actually the potatoes performed terribly. So <laughs> Mark Watney might have a little bit of a difficult time. Well, uh, like I think them, it was, uh, uh, Mor Morgan told us that a. There's a Peruvian potato that does does well. Uh, uh, I, I'm gonna. I, we, she, she couldn't tell us everything that she's got going on because they have a. They're still talking to VCs, but uh, um, 
and, and there's also a, uh, a an experiment at, at NASA called Veggie, which is actually flying on the International Space Station right now. Uh, ah, yes, yes, I've heard of that one, the one where the astronauts are growing their own lettuce and eating it, etc., which is very yeah. Popular. I mean, it's, it's baby steps, but... Uh, uh, it's only about the size of a microwave. <laughs> yeah, it's a very small, low-power experiment, uh, but it, it's a proof of concept. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and believe me, get, getting anything on the space station is extremely cha- challenging just uh, because of all the hoops you have to jump through. So uh, I, my, my kudos to anybody who got that to happen. We've only got a few minutes left, so I'd like to ask all of you guys what you think about the NASA Deep Space Gateway. Are you fans? I I better not say what I feel about that. (laughs) (laughs) Ryan? Uh, uh, hmm. So I think that if NASA wants to be... If NASA wants to be on the moon, they should actually go there and go down to the surface instead of sitting there and staring at the moon um it seems i i i certainly see where they're coming from in that they know how to build a space station it's very modular and they want to expand on the commercial resupply missions and give another destination for private companies to go to which is great but it's a real shame that they're not pursuing lunar surface missions if they're putting so much resource so many resources into building this gateway um, so I see where they're coming from, and given their budget, I can understand this modular approach. Um, my personal viewpoint would be to partner more with private companies, and in particular work with SpaceX on missions like Red Dragon, where you push that architecture. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a pity they're not focusing on using the gateway to actually explore the lunar surface. Mm, I think it offers um, a way to teleoperate rovers and things like that. That may well be needed on Mars. That's that's one of the other things that worries me about going straight to Mars. Do we need to send astronauts first to orbit or to Phobos to set the base up? Well, that, that that's an engineering problem. That uh, there's always trade-offs, right? Uh, you, you can. Uh, I I believe that there will be uh, uncrewed missions. To Mars that will um, establish some very very essential infrastructure. Um, you'll have robots that'll go out and lay out solar panels and do all the things that you don't really need astronauts for. Uh, These robots don't exist yet. Well, that that's not that's not that hard to that that's just a question of doing really? the work. Isn't that's not yeah. hard. It, well, <laughs> when I say it's not hard, I mean it's it's not. Uh, it's not beyond the state of the art. No, it, it, it's it. It is. Uh, there. When I say hard, I mean something we have no idea how to do. Uh, we know we know how to build robots. We know how to build. We, we know how to build rovers on the surface of Mars that's been successfully done for since the nineties. Uh, and uh, what you have to do is figure out how to do it uh, in, in more efficiently. Mm-hmm. And. Um, I, I think that can happen to the deep space gateway to get back to your original question. Uh, I don't think it exists for the purpose of furthering exploration. I think it exists because of constraints imposed by the space launch system and, uh, and politic and, and the very, you know, they're always trying to sneak everything under this very tight funding profile that they have, uh, which is approved year to year. It's, Nobody ever says, here's enough money to go out to do the next 10 years. Right? It's always this year's money, this fiscal year's money, which starts on October 1st every year. Uh, and so uh, squeezing under that profile, uh, first of all, the Deep Space Gateway is not funded now, and nobody knows where the money's coming from. Uh, so, and, and given the current state of relationship between the legislature and the administration, it doesn't look like there's going to join hands, sing Kumbaya and come up with the money uh, in an already very adversarial budget budgeting process. Uh, so 
in my view, it it won't happen for one thing. It it can't happen for for financial reasons. It's a black hole for money. It could cost a lot of money, and uh, it, it's not necessary. What they really need to do is re rethink the whole SLS system, uh, which I know, having spent already spent billions of dollars on it, they don't want to do. But that's a sunk cost fallacy. Uh, mm. When you when you have just because you spend a lot of money on something doesn't mean you have to keep spending money on it. <laughs> well, bear, bearing in mind that the first flight is currently scheduled for some point that hasn't been announced in 2019, by which point we will already have the Falcon Heavy having had many, many flights. The new new Glenn will be coming along as well. People will really be starting to question the utility of the SLS potentially. I think, oh, that, I, yeah. I, I think, I, I think that's uh, in, in the circles I move in, uh, that question has been asked for several years now. Uh, now, it, it, let's, I mean, a lot of this has to do, I mean, let's face it, the reason the SLS was originally funded was to keep the shuttle workforce going. And it, it's a political and financial uh, uh, creature. It's not a, it's not an optimal exploration strategy. Uh, if if you tr strip away all that, all if you could, you just can't do it. But if you could strip away all the political issues, I think there's uh, gambling. You'd have, a, you'd have a different sheet of paper to work work on. I think there's a, there's a, there's a certainly a certain amount of, gam of gambling when it comes to making certain decisions regarding space exploration in general, especially when uh, you, we go into uncharted territories, which the majority of uh, deep space uh, exploration is going to be uncharted territory. So you don't know what your investment. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether or not your decision on where do you want to invest the limited money that are that uh, that we have to budget, uh, um, you know, whether that decision is is a, is a good one or not, because all it takes is one failure and we can set the entire pro the entire space program back ten or tw ten or twenty years. It's a critical well, failure. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean th this is something that that's a big conversation now. Is are we too risk averse? Exactly. I yeah. mean, uh, and, and if we have, if, if an astronaut dies, does that mean we stop what we're doing and and reconsider everything? And, and you know, we we lost seven, fourteen people on the shuttle program. Right. You can't control public opinion. You don't know what the reaction is going to be. Uh, you know, to, by by the public at large. And you know, there's a lot of people out there that are skeptical to begin with. That's the reality, unfortunately. So well, it takes is one excuse to be even more against. You know expenditures. Well, uh, and, and it's also a reason to think that the, what the private sector is doing, including things like Mars One, and uh, what SpaceX, what Bezos are doing, uh, are all to be encouraged. And let a let a thousand flowers bloom. Also, it's not, and it's not just Americans, and it's not just Europeans. Uh, the Chinese are very active in this area. Uh, they would love to be have the first. They love the first band, person standing on Mars to be Chinese, uh, and they will do what they can to make that happen. If 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 Americans drop the ball, yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I I don't mind if if the SLS is just reserved for launching very heavy exoplanet telescopes. I mean, obviously, <laughs> it'll be used for potentially Europa Clipper. You can forget <laughs> it. Just leave the Falcon Heavy for all the human missions. Well, that's you know, nice that, and cheap. Just give I, it to the science community. And that, that's the tyranny. But the problem is the tyranny of the fairing, right? I mean, uh, the, the JWST has to be folded up in this ridiculously complicated way. And origami. It's not, <laughs> origami. It's, a, it's an origami telescope. And... Yes, billions of dollars have been spent on figuring out how to unfold it safely and get the sun shield out. Without the sun shield, it doesn't really work properly. Uh, the uh, it, it's it's a incredibly complicated piece of engineering. I believe it's going to work, but uh, there is a lot of risk, and the reason for that is why because it all has to fit inside this fairing uh, of an Ariane five. Uh, which is a big fairing by today's standards, but it's really only about five meters. Uh, so, you know, that that's... Uh, and also, it, another problem that we have is every, things like the JWST have to be designed to survive launch. Right. If they could be assembled in space, you'd only have to design small components to survive launch and then put them together in space and 
uh, so that I think is the next frontier is, is in space assembly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'm not just not just me saying that a lot of people are thinking along those lines, including NASA and certainly DARPA. I think uh, putting, you know, long, long, that way you're not because I mean, the biggest fairing we're going to see for the next 10 years is going to be a seven meter fairing on New Glenn. And uh, probably. Uh, probably not going to see a bigger fairing than that until uh, ITS. And if ITS ever happens. Uh, so uh, that is, you know, we're looking, you know, 12, 15 years away. So if you want a big space telescope, you got to put it together. When, once it, you got to get it, launch pieces of it and put it together up there mm-hmm. uh, with, with robots, probably, or, or possibly astronauts. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, guys. We are out of time. Thank you, Ryan, in particular. It's been fascinating to learn about exoplanet atmospheres and about your plans to go to Mars one day. That's it for today. Uh, you guys can each say goodbye if you like. Uh, you I, have one, I have one thing I'd like to add, Adam. Uh, uh, and I'm... I'm uh, you know what? I... Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay. Uh, the person who has designed the Unseen Podcast uh, banner uh, uh, that we use on our, we- on our website, uh, it, uh, I told him I'd give him a shout out. Uh, J- J. Serrano, S E R R A N O design. Uh, he does flyers, paintings, digital art, shirt designs, uh, photo retouching, whatever you want. He's a, he's a graphic designer. Uh, and uh, we'll have a link to his website on the show notes. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so we shall be back in two weeks' time when I will be inviting a famous YouTuber and the publisher of Universe Today. Do you guys know who that might be? Ah, that'd be Fraser Kane. <laughs> that would be Fraser Kane, yeah. Fraser will be joining us in two weeks' time. So that's it for today. Thank you all for taking part. Thank you for listening. We do appreciate you listening. That's it from us, and goodbye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye, Ryan. Bye, Paul.